All right. Well, this is the second in my series of these spotlights on game designers. Uh, my first one was on Richard Berg, and this one's going to be on Francis Tresham. It's going to be a great deal shorter because Tresham hasn't done a lot of games. However, uh, out of what he's done, he sort of changed the nature of the world for me and it had a significant effect on the uh, on the gaming world in general. Uh, also unlike Berg, he's not a war game designer. Um, I've always thought of him since I learned the term Euro game as a Euro game designer. Uh, I'm told that's not really the case. However, when I look at his games they seem to exemplify uh, the very principles that Euro games are sort of founded on, with maybe one caveat, which is he doesn't try to make them short. He doesn't try to say, ah, let's get this out for a two two hour game. Let's try to trim it down and make it a, a, as tight and, and and as many decisions as we can make in that time. However, there is this tremendous effort in at least some of the games the real game changers to the gaming world that I see that have captured uh, an elegance that I don't see in very many games. You see it maybe in the top of the Euro category. You don't really see it in the war games. War games don't tend to have that kind of elegance. They're trying to represent something real and something dirty, right? Uh, so let's take a look I have a very small collection of trash and games, which isn't surprising. There aren't a lot of games, you know. Uh, and the first one that I suffered <laughs> to own was Civilization. Now, this was a game when I read about it in the general. Uh, Avalon Hill had, I think it had already been designed and, and existed in, in England under under... Heartland Tree Fall, I'm not sure. But when I first read about it, I had kind of the, oh, what a cool idea for a game, this, you know, civilization building and, and the dawn of, uh, uh, of humanity. And boy, that sounds exciting. Ah, but I don't know. And especially when I read about a luckless combat system it, it, it sounds like it's going to feel too abstracted and, 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 and maybe too simplistic. And uh, I, I shied away from it for that. I was unwilling to actually buy it, uh, even though there was this big push in, in beautiful illustrated pictures. What, what other kind of pictures are there? Uh, illustrated articles uh, it, within the general that showed something, this impressive, pretty... Uh, game on area control and some cards and all this this funky stuff it looked like it had some intriguing aspects but I couldn't do it and a couple of my friends broke down and got this for me as a birthday present and uh, it had a kind of a, a sleepover birthday bunch of friends and it was a it, it was a really cool party in a lot of ways but one of the coolest things was being given this and nobody else was giving me gifts I think I had specifically kind of said it's not that kind of thing you know we're just hanging out for my birthday but uh, these two a pair of brothers I'm still vaguely in contact with them over Facebook uh, bought me this game and from the moment I, we, we played it that night, uh, we all got together and tried it that night. It was interesting. There's no question. I had kind of the normal guilt reaction when somebody buys me a present uh, that feels all wrong, you know? I don't know why. Uh, just, I don't know if it makes me feel obligated to them or whatever, but this was clearly something I enjoyed. And outside of whatever discomfort I have from being given a gift, I had uh, a great time with this game. And soon after that, I 
went on a trip with my family to St. Louis. And I think this was kind of the first time bringing it to new people. I showed up at a, a gaming club there. I think this was in St. Louis. Uh, there was a, a game store there that I found out about. And I was like, oh, heck, I'll bring this game that I just got because I brought it with me for whatever reason. Uh, and I showed up there, and for the most part, people were playing D&D and Starfleet Battles, both of which I was familiar with, but uh, I managed to grab, I don't know, five or six people for a game of Civilization. And this was the first time that I brought it to a bunch of people who weren't really used to, um, you know, maybe the heavier board games coming from me or whatever. And everybody walked away loving the game. We didn't have time to finish it because, you know, it, 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 people don't always have eight hours or whatever that, that would have been involved in it. But easy to teach game, simple mechanics, and uh, not a lot of really hard decision making, but this wonderful trading system. Just a magical game overall across the board. And uh, several other times in my life I've brought it to essentially non-heavy board gamers and they loved it. Uh, I can think of one person, and it was somebody who had nothing against heavy board games in general, he, he liked others, who walked away and said, I really don't like that game. But, you know, bringing it to gamers who were mainly role players or maybe light Nuke War type players, it just had such an effect of, wow, this is a really amazing game. There's something fantastic here. In the way that, say, a diplomacy is something fantastic. So that was the first game that I saw of his. And I didn't realize who, who designed it or whatever. You know, I read in the general, some guy in England that we contracted to do this game, whatever. Um, the next one was 1830, and I didn't realize they were the same person. Uh, I realized, again, this was a, hey, we contracted with this interesting designer, uh, standard Avalon Hill practice, but they seemed to make a big deal about it the same way they did with Civ, and brought you this game. And I had tried something like Rail Baron already, and uh, so I picked, I picked up 1830. And it was something magical for me there, too, again. Uh, just, again, no luck really involved in the game. In fact, the very little luck in civilization has written. As, as written, there is none, I believe. Uh, if you add the expansion cards for the trading goods, you get a, a significant amount of luck in there with the way the cards uh, fall because they get kind of shuffled and you don't know what kind of commodity you're going to get. And you may have to scramble a little harder to make things work for you. But it's still fairly limited. When you walk over to 1830, uh, the only piece of luck you have is where are you going to sit? <laughs> That's it. You know, and once you get that determined, you have your bidding on these private companies where seating could be important, you could be denied the right to bid on anything because you got seated in the last seat and everything is gone except one company at the end. Uh, likewise, who's sitting on your left and right and what kind of person they are is very important because the sequence of play goes on the same way. So it's not an unimportant piece of luck, but it is very, very little luck for a game featuring many, many players. And again, with this game, uh, now, it didn't have the same kind of acceptance that Civilization did. But with this game, I found just this, again, total capturing of, of, of the spirit of the robber baron but without too much detail. It just nailed it dead on, and I'll say Civilization does the same thing. Without too much detail, it really captures
captures that whole spirit of the civilization building. Without too much detail, but also without cutting away too much. The common Euro game makes, for me, what is an error in terms of taking not just the detail away, but the spirit of the, of, of the situation away too many times. And in these two games, that spirit is still there without digging into all, all the uh, hard details. Granted, both games are a little longer than most uh, Euro gamers want to play. Civilization always used the one hour per player, which seems to work pretty well. You play with four or five players, it's four or five hours. You play with six or seven, it's six or seven hours. Uh, I'm not sure what happens if you try to play a two or three player game. I haven't done that enough to really pay attention. With uh, 1830, the base game is probably a six hour game again. That's more of a commitment than modern gamers seem to like. Uh, but when we were playing this, uh, and when we were introduced to it, it was certainly within the realm of what we would put down for a normal weekend gaming. Weekday gaming, hey, you know, normally we couldn't get it, but we did manage to put out uh, a couple of short games of 1830 in that time. That's more like a three to four hour game, and still captures a lot of the feeling it just doesn't have that long game aspect to it where your decisions, you can watch them come to fruition over, you know, this extended period of time. There's something very pleasing about a game just due to length. Uh, to me, that's something that's missing from these faster paced games. There's not the time to sit back and enjoy your plans maturing in the same way. Anyway. Uh, I don't feel like 1830, and in fact, this isn't Tresham's first 18x X game, actually 1829 is. I've played that once, uh, much, much flatter. It doesn't have that same cutthroat, that same really harsh, the ability to take your, your opponents and, and really trash them. In fact, it has this very bland feel to, to me where you're sitting there and you don't have a lot of really significant choices. You don't have a way to shift the game rapidly. Uh, so one of the big things about 1830 was always, hey, somebody sitting on a couple shares of my stock? They can have my company now. And I can do things that maybe they aren't the greatest thing in the world for me, but maybe I have some means to turn money around by selling, you know, private companies into my company. Doing a lot of damage to my company, I can hand it off to somebody in a bad shape and I can get a benefit in terms of having a lot more cash to start something that I'd rather have. This is especially important with companies that are a little worn out or a little troubled. Well, I don't feel that same opportunity was there in my one playing of 1829. It was lacking that really cutthroat experience. I'd still pick up a copy of 29 his 25 uh, updating of it. But that's more for a I collect XX games at this point. So XX didn't have, though, this kind of influence on the gaming world in general, I think, the way Civilization did. Civilization really hit hard. Just the fact that you could sway almost any type of gamer in that day and age into playing it and loving it. Uh, you saw the computer game taking off from this in a way that, and, and there's just no way that you can look at uh, Sid Meier's Civilization and say, you know, he wasn't, he didn't play Civ first. No, he saw Civ first. He tried to. It's a very different game, but some of that difference is because it's a computer, you know. And in that day and age, doing the computer the way that it was, it's a special game in its own way, but it is completely derived to me. Now, I don't feel like 1830 is as completely derived as I see uh, Sid Meier's Civilization. Um, 
But I don't think there's anything as completely derived from 1830, except for Avalon Hill's 1830 you know, game. Uh, you see things like, um, I think, railroad tycoon, computer game. Which has some aspects with the stock dealing, etc. But there's uh, there's definitely a feel that that's a more uh, that's more based on running these trains and keeping them running on time, and it's a very different. You've got kind of this dispatcher type feel on it, in addition to the other things. So I don't feel it's as as derivative a game. And you could say, well, in a lot of ways, uh, Sid Meier's Civilization is indeed a, it's more of a war-type game and a, a building, etc. Yeah, I know, I know. Uh, and maybe both of them derive back to this in, in a nice way. I'm not sure. But then when we look at uh, the influence, though, that the 18xx has on the rest of the board gaming world, very, very limited. It's got one niche. It's got the 18xx players, right? Um, and then from there, you could look at the winsome games and say, yeah, you kind of see in them this attempt to capture the XX feel and maybe put it in a shorter, smaller package that's more digestible to gamers. And maybe, maybe. I, I feel like that's even a smaller crowd, that what you really have there is a subset of the XX players who've branched out in that. With the one exception that now some of those winsome designs that you see out there, uh, things like Chicago Express, and you know, I don't know which ones are which really in terms of, I don't know who has the rights to it. I saw obviously there was some complaining going on as if the idea was taken or something. I, I don't care about that. What I'm saying is I see a, 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 a similarity between those winsome designs and things like Chicago Express and Steam in, in such a way that, look, they're obviously doing it. In the same way, I would say that the winsome designs are somewhat more distant, but still derived from the XX side. Now, when we look at Tresham's XX contributions, those are actually pretty limited. You start with 29, and you could say, okay, well, then there's the 29 Northern. Okay, I, I, I can buy that. It's a different game. It's got a different feel from what I can understand from reading it. I've never actually played it. And then we've got these 25, which look like spin-offs and, and, and redesigns of the 29 series, and they may be better. I, I have no idea again. He's also credited with 53, which I hadn't realized. I've played 53, 1853, um, once or twice. That's a weird game. It's got some luck in it, uh, at least with the expansion where you've got maybe events or something like that going on. It's got some really weird track, uh, different gauges of track and stuff like that. Some funky stuff. I don't remember it playing terribly well. I don't remember being all that much more thrilled with it than I was with 1829. 1830 was something magical. And it seems like other people have taken that 1830-ish design and done some pretty impressive things with it as well. So I've got my 1861, the Russian Railways, which I've done a video of. 18AL, which I've done a video of, and 18GA, which are basically 1830, just said somewhere else. Um, 1861 is not. It's very different. But it feels like it took that 1830 flavor and made something nicer or very different out of it. Not necessarily nicer. There's a cleanness to 30 that I like compared to. Uh, the Mayfair ones, uh, 56, I think it is. The Canadian, I own it. I, and 1870. Slow moving behemoth that it is, and 2038 from Tim Jim, which is basically 1870 in space, as far as I'm concerned, in terms of it just has something very wrong that makes it take an interminable amount of time and, and not really fall correctly. It's like it's not, you don't get hurt by making what seem like bad moves. In fact, those bad moves actually work well within these two games.
moves that are, I, I call bad moves because they're against my instincts. It looks like you're buying trains that are going to die, and you're not, uh, or very likely not, unless somebody pays a heavy price to prevent, to, to cause you damage. So, there are some very impressive XX games out there, in my opinion, that are derived nicely from 30, but they're not Tresham designs. Tresham's also credited in 1835, and I know a lot of people kind of like 35. I'm not a huge fan of it. I feel like it's a little too slow-moving, a little too calm in terms of you're just picking... Again, there's not a lot of movement. There's not a lot of opportunity for these big moves. Uh, the opportunity really is in setting up your position with your railroad in the long term, in terms of track and in terms of uh, perhaps your position in the Prussian. He's credited on that, but I think that crediting is more, hey, he designed the entire uh, genre and we're going to give him full designer credit. I may be mistaken on that. He may have been more involved in it than, than that, but uh, that, that was the feeling I got from the designer's notes. From the, was, I am adding him as a designer because, you know, and, and maybe giving him royalties for all I know. Okay, so that's two big games. One, I think, really changed the gaming hobby in a way that I would say some of the burden designs that I looked at in the last video. Yeah. I better check my time. I ran out part way through last time. Okay, I'm gonna cut there and move, uh, and move to another video. I've got a decent amount of time, but I just wanna make sure. All right, now, like I said, we've got these two games, uh, one of which to me is a giant civilization, and the other one has defined a whole, br well, actually both have defined their own branch of game, uh, but civilization had this widespread appeal, and frankly for me, this was the gateway game. This was the game that I could bring to other people and move them away from you know, maybe a game of supremacy or which isn't too light in and of itself or nuke war or something else and a little bit closer to maybe not a full-on war game but some of those wimp games, things like Kingmaker or whatever. Um, this was something that gave them a better rooting Supremacy probably could work in that same sort of way. But civilization was the one that nobody walked away from unhappy, which was the great thing for me with that. Uh, all right. Both two games, you know. How does that qualify? Well, it's not really two games. And it's also, uh, I would add one more to that in terms of having pleased me greatly which is uh, Revolution, the Dutch Revolt. I have a video of that up. Ah! You know, that's a game that if it came out back in 84, 85, and it, it, it's its own design, it's its own innovative system, it's every bit as, as clever and well-constructed in a lot of ways as Civilization or uh, as 18xx. The subject matter is probably not as exciting to most people, though. You know, choo-choos. Choo-choos are great. Everybody loves choo-choos, right? I mean, there's a huge segment of the gaming population that's into seeing train games. And civilization games, well, maybe there weren't a lot of them. There were a few kicking around, things like Barbarians and Empire and stuff like that. I, I may have the wrong, uh, wrong name there. But there were a few kicking around back from the 70s that were trying to grasp that idea and had done it on a very light wargaming type flavor. Well, Civilization brought something new and really made that into a popular type of game. And we've seen people going back to it 
and drawing from from that well again, trying to make a shorter, uh, an easier to play civilization type game, or maybe a more warlike one in something like History of the World, which doesn't have you know the advances, etc. But uh, or a more complicated one in the way of Age of Renaissance, which really does feel like civilization, even if it's a little different. It's not really portraying a full civilization from the same military standpoint, but more from a trading standpoint. It doesn't feel like that when you play it, though. It feels like a military one. But revolution is not going to have that kind of influence. It's been around for a while. It's not a terribly popular game. It's still big. Uh, I don't remember how long it takes, but it takes a few hours. It's uh, today's gamer just does not seem to be willing to play something of that weight. And it may be that gaming has become sort of so mainstream and broad of a base that there isn't room for the guy, well, there isn't as much room for someone who's willing to put in six hours to play a game. So it's harder to sell these games and it's harder to bring them to the table and I know that we found this even back in the, in the late 90s when I was gaming with people who were, you know, just really getting into this Euro craze. Uh, and they started, you know, preferring not to play one big game over the weekend day, uh, over a day in the weekend. But instead, uh, let's play four or five little things. There was definitely a group who did not want to commit to the whole day on one game. There would be people who couldn't commit to the whole day and, you know, that would influence it somewhat as well. So as, the, as, as gaming's gotten more popular, well, it becomes easier, you know, there's less committed players who are less willing to put, devote an entire weekend day to a game. So there's sort of a broader base on those lighter games. This is not the way things were once, because, you know, when I got into gaming, and in the first several, say, the first decade of my gaming life, uh, you had, as a, the major competition uh, with the board games, and honestly, the non-wargaming board games were pretty sparse and, and, and as a selection, certainly compared to today. Uh, you really had sort of this wargaming on one side, and that could go very heavy. Somewhere in the middle, and a lot of the people that I knew gravitated towards this, uh, maybe ver what would be considered light war games now, or what I call wimp games, but also these other games like Civilization or 18xx that fit in there. And then role playing. And what was kind of neat was you could grab some of the role players for that middle ground. You couldn't really get them usually into the war games. Anyway, the dynamics are different now, you know. And I think between subject matter, no choo choos, no big civilizations, the Dutch revolt, you know, how many people are really into this, right? <laughs> now, for me, that's a great subject matter. But it's not even hooking me the way uh, these other games did. And probably because it's still a game like the other two designs, like the XX design, like the civilization design, that kind of asks for you to play it with other people. Uh, it's not as solo capable a game. Now, Civilization, I certainly played solo a number of times, but it is not in my heart where it is because of solo playing. It's in my heart because it served as that gateway game, right? Uh, likewise, XX is not in my heart so much because of solo playing, although I've done a decent amount of that, but because of the exciting games of it. 1830, where uh, a friend of mine and I colluded on trying to build the perfect uh, New York Central, New York, New Hampshire route, just to score maximum money. 
and there was all kind of trading going on. And really, in a way, we were kind of violating the spirit that most groups would play with. But we played enough 1830 that I don't think it was frowned on too much. And at the end of the whole thing, me and one other player, not the guy I was colluding with, tied for first. And it's like, you know, there were so many exchanges of, uh, uh, of private companies and, and people selling privates to other people where one buck could have made the difference in the game. Uh, the fact that we were doing weird stuff caused some of the other players to jump in and do kind of weird stuff as well. And it was just like, this was the weirdest game of all, and then for this to have tied, where there were just so many opportunities where a dollar could have changed hands, you know, differently, was just astounding. Um, games where someone was bankrupted and, and, and forced to sort of sit through the game with very little... Uh, games where someone ran a company into the brown and left it there and nobody would touch it. Just so many different strategies that, that were tried and, and, and the one that we never got, the one that I always wanted was to go bankrupt and win the game. I don't know if anybody's ever done that. I'd love to hear if they have. Uh, not just in 1830, in any ATXX game, to tell you the truth, because that was always the primary, you know, I was talking uh, in conversation on a YouTube channel uh, with Hello Greg, Greg about, hey, what about other victory conditions? Well, there's my other victory condition. I don't just want to win with XX, say. I also want to, uh, I want to not only win, but win by going bankrupt. Sort of an uber victory condition there. That's the kind of thing that I like to put into my games. I'm not just trying to win this. I'm trying to win this in a very specific way because I think that would just be so cool. And there would be something that I would be doing that I think doesn't totally violate the trying to win, but I don't know how to win that way. And I don't know anybody who's done it. So it would be a very tricky thing to manage. Anyway, revolution... Uh, I just haven't been able to bring it to people. Uh, I don't think I've played it opposed yet. It's a fantastic game. Uh, but I think I'd have a tough time if I brought it to uh, the monthly gaming group that gets together here at uh, University of Advancing Technology. I had a hard time getting people to commit to anything moderately long like that. Uh, in my case, La Revolution Francaise, I could not. I could only get like three people total. <laughs> uh, in the end to commit there were people who were interested in it but then they backed out you know, eh, I don't know if I'm going to be there that long you know excited about it but not willing to commit the modern gamer right mm -hmm. um, Tresham's done a couple of other things that I'm kind of interested in I looked at a, a couple of these one I'm not even going to touch too hard it looked uh, it looked kind of weird, a stock game that just looked scary, had a bad rating. Uh, one that looks interesting to me is Spanish Main. Every now and then I notice this and say, huh, why can't I find this? Well, it goes for a lot of money, and it doesn't look terribly interesting. It's got dice that you roll, averaging dice, which I assume means it gets rid of, you know, the, the extremes uh, that you roll for movement, and this, that, and the other. Might be interesting. I don't it looks like something that could have come out by anyone in that time period, though. And to me, I look at the Tresham designs and even Revolution and say, wow, that's really out there. You know, that's very different and is a game changer in terms of this huge shift, even if nobody follows, that he's taken, in the case of Revolution, that he's taken from the rest of what's out there. I don't feel like Spanish Rain looks that way. And then something, and this is very intriguing, although less for me, called Ancient Kingdoms. Now, this came out in the mid-70s, if I'm not mistaken. I just looked this up, you know, because I'm planning on doing this. Well, it looks like your classic Euro from modern time. Uh, it's sort of a tiling type game, this, that, and the other. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised 
if it's not too far from the stuff that caught on some 20 years later, in, in America at least. And it's funny because that's what's kind of been put towards, you know, 1829 is not, it, it came out significantly before uh, 1830 did. Civilization, I think, came out a few years before Avalon Hill put it out. Each of these games was not only a massive shift, but one that was er significantly earlier than sort of its effects take place. Uh, the shame, of course, is there is no... So, the games that really shook the world weren't put out by Heartland Tradefall, right? You know, I mean, they were put out originally, but they got picked up by Avalon Hill. And this is something you could say, you know, there's a lot of things I don't like about Avalon Hill, but one of the things they really did was they picked up interesting concepts from other people. And some of those were, you know, SPI, <laughs> uh, metagaming, um, obviously Heart and Tree Fall, and uh, I don't know who, who wrote, who, who put Titan out, but Titan is one of those damn, you know, this is just such a different game. And they grabbed this and put it out under their, their packaging and made it a hugely popular game. And that's what they did for these. Well, Phalanx is not Avalon Hill of that day. Phalanx, it just doesn't have that kind of market share that I can see. It doesn't have that kind of influence in any market where it can push something the way that Avalon Hill and I don't think there's anything out there right now, uh, certainly not in sort of the wargaming side of things. But even the Euro games that sell huge copies don't seem to have the kind of influence that Avalon Hill once had. Maybe I'm just mistaken. Maybe I don't get something here. But I hear these huge print runs, and I hear these huge sales that supposedly are dwarfing wargaming at its height, and, you know, I, in most cases, I'm not seeing the effect in the way that, say, a civilization or an 1830 had. Certainly Settlers of Catan is up there, right? And a few others. There are a few. But, eh, I don't know if a single company has the kind of influence that I want. For good or bad, you know. So, and certainly Phalanx is not it. And Revolution is not getting to the number of people that would. And again, the topic is just not what it's going to be. Anyway, is Tresham, you know, as influential as some of the people that I'm putting them above in the gaming industry as a whole? Probably not. But in my gaming history, in my uh, time, he's had a huge effect with two of his games. Uh, and, you know, that's what this is about. This is a personal exploration. So I want to give the feelings on that. And, you know, again, maybe somebody else will cover with as much sort of personal impact as some of the other people. I'd like, to, I'd like to hear, you know, the effect of some of these other game designers on, on others as well. All right, thanks.